Hello, everyone, and welcome to AASC's webinar, Secrets of the Manual, presented by Carol Drucker. Today is April 27, 2017. My name is Christina Harbour, and I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker. Carol Drucker is Principal of Drucker Zidel Structural Engineers in Chicago, Illinois. She has worked extensively on the structural design of many connection projects throughout the country and is recognized as an industry leader. She received her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Purdue University and her master's degree in structural engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. She's authored many articles on connection design and currently serves on the AISC Committee on Specifications. Welcome, Carol, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thanks, Christina. Can, there, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great. Well, today's presentation is on secrets of the manual. These are not necessarily secrets per se, but they are tips and suggestions that will help with efficiency whether you are doing design or checking somebody else's calculations. It is also meant to help you if you are preparing for the SE or PE exam. All right, so let's get going. Oh, jump the slide. I'm going to go back. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. To take full advantage of the information that is contained in the manual, the first thing to do is actually understand the informa what information is in the manual. So we're going to do a brief overview of all the different parts in the manual. There are 17 different parts. And then we will come back and hit the highlights and then finish off with some example calculations. Part 1 contains the dimension, dimensional and section properties of the standard steel shapes available. The dimensions are given in both decimal for engineering purposes and fractional for detailing purposes. The section properties include such things as moment of inertia and area. Part 2 contains just a general wealth of information. It discusses the various codes and specifications that need to be followed for steel design. There is also a brief overview of several different fundamental uh, design principles for steel design. These things, this includes stability, integrity, and thermal loading, things like that. There are tables to help with material selection and a discussion on how to convert between LRFD and ASD. Main member design is contained in part 3 through part 6 of the manual. For design of members and flexures, such as beams, that is in part 3. For members in compression, such as columns or bracing, it's in part 4. Part 5 is for the design of tension members. And members subject to combined forces is in part 6. Now looking at this slide, it really looks like the heart of the manual is dedicated to connection design. Part 7 through Part 15 of the manual covers connection design. Both design of bolted connections is in Part 7. And this is where all the tables for eccentrically loaded bolt groups are contained. And for welds, the tables for eccentrically loaded weld group tables are contained in Part 8. Part 9. Part 9 is actually my personal favorite part of all the parts of the manual. If you're just going to read one, I would suggest to read Part 9. And the reason why I like Part 9 the most is because it contains a lot of theoretical discussion that helps with even simple connection design all the way up to the more complex connection design. Very useful section of the manual. Part 10 contains all the tables for simple beam shear connections that are commonly used, bolted bolted clips, bolted welded. All the tables for that is included in Part 10. Part 11 and 12 are for moment connections. Part 13 is for bracing and trusses. Part 14 covers base plates, anchor rods, and comm splices. And Part 15 is for hangers and brackets. AISC was also nice enough to include three different specifications and codes in the manual. In Part 16, there includes the AISC 36010 spec. Now, the manual is really more of a user guide for the specification, the 36010 spec. But the manual does include 
the specification in it. The specification is the, the legal ANSI document, and the provisions in the specification should be followed when designing steel structures. For bolted connections, Part 16 contains the RCSC bolt specification along with the coded standard practice. And lastly, Part 17 contains miscellaneous information. I really don't use Part 17 all that often, but it's nice to have at your fingertips if you need this miscellaneous information. The coefficient of thermal expansion for various materials is listed in there, and the thicknesses of different gauge metals are also listed in there. But then, then comes the general nomenclature, which is just basically variable definitions, and then the index so you can find what you're looking for. All right, Christina, do you want sure, to and take believe, it from here? I believe Carol would like to survey our audience on what their favorite part of the manual is. She mentioned that I believe Carol, you said part nine is your favorite. Yeah, that's what I, I would say I use part nine the most. I'm kind of curious what other people have a tendency to use the most. Okay, so everyone, if you could just go ahead, cast your vote by clicking on the little radio button next to your favorite part and click submit. Okay, I think we have a pretty good survey of our audience right now. We'll look at the results. So Carol, it looks like about 40% of our audience really likes part one, dimensions and properties. No. Oh. Okay, well what's number two? Because we were going to take that one off the list. <laughs> well, flexural numbers. Flexural is, numbers. Uh, very popular and there's also a good number of people that share your opinion of Part nine being the most useful. There we go. Okay. Well, that is. No we'll see if people change their mind after the presentation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Take you back. Okay. Part one of the manual is is actually very useful um, to get the section properties. That is the most beneficial part of part one is the section properties. But I actually try very hard not to open the manual when getting the section properties, especially if I am designing in Excel. A way more efficient way to design in Excel is to link your spreadsheet to the Excel database and extract the information. We used to kind of use the VLOOKUP command in our office, but I think over time that has evolved over to the index match. It's a really nice Excel command for retrieving information from the database. And the database, I believe it is free on AISC's website. I know it's on there, and I do. I'm not so sure if it's free, but it's at least it's on the AISC website. Also contained in Part 1 are the angle gauges. Angle gauges are particularly useful, let's try the arrow pointer here, for single angle and double angle braces because the work line for the brace is on the gauge, the G1 line. If it was a welded brace, then the work line would be on the center of gravity of the angle. But for a bolted brace, it is on the gauge line. I have been lobbying AISC to put the angle gauges, as also the wide plane gauges, in the database. Currently, the gauges are not in there. I do think it would be very beneficial to have this information in the database. In our office, we typically just go back into the database and add it so we can easily extract it when designing it in Excel. Also included, is the weldable flat width for HSF members. Say if we have an HSF column and you need to reinforce the face for axial load, if you put a 7-inch wide plate on an 8-inch wide column, it's very likely that the longitudinal welds right down the side will not be able to be placed because of the radiuses at the edges of the column. So you have to look at the weldable flat width given in Part 1 and then back it up a little bit for a shelf so there's sufficient room to place the fillet weld, and that is the maximum width that really should be placed on the face of an HSS member. And likewise, if you have a column with a flange plate welded, if you have an 8-inch wide column and an 8-inch wide flange plate, you're probably not going to get 8 inches of weld across, again, due to the radiuses at the corner of the HSS column.
Oops. All right. Bear with me. Uh, what do I do here? <laughs> okay. Part two does contain a lot of information. Uh, I use the beam bearing discussion a lot. Beam bearing is very common in steel construction. And you might think intuitively that the top, let's see if I can get rid of this, the top flange of the beam right here doesn't really have any load at the end of the member. And you might think, ah, oh, it's unloaded, there's no force in there, I don't have to restrain the top flange. But you do need to provide for rotational stability and brace the top flange at the end of members. So in this particular case, you kind of don't want the beam to roll off the support. And various ways to provide rotational stability for bearing connections are discussed in part two. Also pretty common in steel construction is to have beams cantilevering over the top of columns. For these types of connections, it's typically preferred to provide a connection between the beam and the column that provides sufficient strength and stiffness per appendix six that both the beam and the column can be considered braced. And different ways to achieve this is also discussed in part two of the manual. Just to make sure that material is being specified properly, you can go to table 2-4. The black boxes indicate the preferred material. Perhaps you're designing a channel and you're not quite sure if grade 50 or grade 36 is the preferred material for channels these days. You can simply look up into the different shapes. You see a C for channels. And grade 36 is still the preferred material for grade 36 chan for, grade, uh, for channels. And then also, you, if you're working with the new A913 still and it's grade 65 and you're not quite sure what FU is, you can simply come into this table, look at FY, and then get, get your FU value. The counterpart for both is in table 2-6. An example would be for anchor rods, the F1554, grade 36 are preferred. But if you don't have quite enough strength and you and uh, it's not preferred to increase the diameter. There's really no problems. You can see that grade 55 is also a preferred material. All right, for main members designed for beams, uh, Table 3-2 is a very beneficial tool. In Table 3-2, it lists all the plastic flexural strengths of all the wide flanges contained in the manual in descending order. And then the, the Shapes are grouped by weight in ascending order with the most efficient, lightest member in that group bold on top. Also listed in this table are the values LP and LR. LP is the maximum unbraced length of the member to achieve the plastic flexural strength of the member. And LR is the maximum unbraced length of the member just before the onset of elastic buckling. If you're Less than LP, your unbraced length, then you can go straight to MP. If you're between LP and LR, no problem. You can simply just interpolate between the MP and MR values given in the table. Also contained in part three are the beam charts that we all probably use in school, where you have the moment along the vertical, the unbraced length along the horizontal. Simply see where those two lines intersect to pick the most economical section. Table 4-1 is useful for sizing columns. You have the unbraced length along the y-axis. If you know the required loading, you can simply come in and pick whatever column size works for the loading. But really more useful in this table are these variables right at the bottom of the table. These variables are used to check if stiffeners are required in the column. For example, you could have a beam to column flange moment connection. And you have to, in that case, you would have to check the column to see if stiffeners are required. We're going to go over this more in detail later. But just by using these variables right here, it's a very quick check to see if the column needs stiffeners. Typically, it's preferred to have clean column shafts and not have stiffeners, not only because of the expense of the stiffeners, but it's also to facilitate erection. If you have a clean column shaft, you can simply just slide the beam down the shaft. 
All right, typically uh, fabricators provide stitch plates and double angle bracing to facilitate shipping, but if the stitch plates are not provided, in lieu of a double angle, what you really have is two single angles with a reduced strength. So it's very important to remember to check if stitch plates are provided or specify the amount of stitch, stitch plates required. It's really not a problem to do this because in AIC's Table 4-9, it lists the number of stitch plates required to achieve the axial strength of the member. But I do want to say be careful because at least in the 14th edition, now I don't know if it's going to be different in the 15th, but in the 14th, they only give tables for FY equals 36 KSI for the angles. And I, I do think it is becoming more and more popular to use grade 50 angles. If this is the case, then you'll have to go to specification chapter E and actually calculate the number of stitch plates required from the, from the equations. Table 4-12 is actually more important for what it doesn't say than what it does say. This table is an excellent reminder that to be careful if you are using a single bolt. There's kind of two schools of thought out there. Those engineers that are very comfortable with using a single bolt in a connection and those who feel like you have to have at least two bolts in a connection for redundancy. If you're going to use a single bolt, in a single angle brace connection, you have to be aware of the implications. In Part E5 of the specification, it gives a simplified design procedure that can be used for single angle members. But to use the, the simplified procedure based on a modified KL over R, the same angle leg at each end of the brace needs to be connected, and, and the ends have to be attached with a minimum of two bolts or welded. So if you're designing the connections and you only provide one bolt, you can no longer include this simplified design procedure and eccentricity, which is neglected in the simplified procedure, now has to be considered about both axes. Now this table does facilitate the design of that eccentricity, but you could inadvertently lower the strength by providing one bolt and not checking for this to see if the angle has sufficient strength. I don't think I would use Table 4-22 when designing in MathCAD or Excel. It's probably a lot quicker just to put the equations in to your, whatever you're designing with. But as a quick check, it certainly is very convenient. If I'm checking calculations and I just want to do a quick one, two, three, Enter the table with the KL over R to find the available critical buckling stress. Here's an example of when I would use that table. Say, uh, say I was checking a Chevron connection, and I wasn't quite sure if the gusset was thick enough. I would determine my K value from Bo Doswell's EJ article, third quarter 2012. Really good article on K values for bracing design. Once I know my K value, which in this case is 0.65, calculate KL over R, then I can go back to the table 4-22 and get my available buckling stress and to check my Whitmore. I do want to add, say that if both these braces were in compression, then probably you shouldn't use a K of, of 0.65. At that point, you can't count on the tension brace to brace the compression brace, but probably then you would want to use more of a sink the case for a single sided brace. Part seven is for bolted connections. Uh, probably the most used item in part seven are the tables for eccentrically loaded bolt groups. You would use these for the design of tabs, uh, extended tabs, very useful for that. But what I use the most are the tables for the bolt insulation tolerances. Table 7-15. Hex head bolts are installed with an impact wrench. And to check for bolt installation tolerances, you can get the socket diameter out of Table 7-15. You can see right in this picture. Simply divide the socket diameter by 2, and that is the installation tolerance that is needed. Right here. Now, the manual also contains installation tolerances for TC bolts. 
TC bolts are just a little bit different than hex head bolts. Here in the hex head, you can see it has a hex head. The TC bolt has a round head. TC bolts are installed with shear wrenches, known in the industry most commonly called as TC guns. Now, AISC does have tables for installation tolerances of TC guns, but I find these to be a, a bit tedious and difficult to understand. So what I typically do is go to a supplier's website. This one supplier, uh, not promoting anyone, but Heath Mitchell's uh, website, GWI Inc., has a lot of technical lit literature on various TC guns. You can pull the literature off the website and look at the various dimensions of the TC gun. You can take half the shoulder or look at the socket and take half the so extension socket diameter. And for your type of connection, once you know the dimensions of the TC gun, you can determine if you have sufficient tolerance to install the bolt. All right, sometimes the question comes up in our office, how do you uncouple a moment over a bolt group? If this is the question that you have, then you can simply go to figure 7-7 in the manual, assume half the bolts in tension, half the bolts in compression, and simply uncouple your moment over the center of gravity of the tension and compression bolt. Once you know your bolt tension, then you can simply proceed with the rest of the design as you would with any connection subject to bolt tension. All right, just for completeness, I do want to say that the manual also contains figure 7-6, which is based on more of an elastic distribution. When I was giving this presentation at the, the steel conference, I was kind of curious. I didn't think anyone, honestly, used the elastic distribution. But in a group of 70, three people did say that they, they use this elastic distribution. But as an alternate to the elastic distribution, I would suggest that uh, more of a plastic distribution would be, should be used, similar to how Tom Murray designs end plates in Design Guide 4 and Design Guide 6. By switching from elastic to a plastic distribution, similar to what we do to base plates or concrete beams, it can be really effective in reducing the bolt tension. And both these design guides are available for free download if you're a member of AISD. All right, similar to, to both, is the part eight for welds. The tables for the eccentrically loaded weld group are contained in part eight, very commonly used. Now, the equations for eccentrically loaded weld groups are right here contain the C1 value. Which C1 equals one if you have 70 KSI a weld electrode, which is most of the time where they're going to be welding with 70 KSI weld electrode. But if a higher strength weld electrode is used, for example, 80 KSI, then the C1 factor is to account for the higher electrode strength. And I always knew this and thought it was just simply the ratio of electrode strength. It made total sense. But you can't simply set C1 equal to the ratio of electrode strength because due to uncertainties with extrapolation, there is a reduction factor applied to the C1 values in Table 8-4. So an example would be for 80 KSI weld electrode, there is a reduction of 0 0.9. So you'd be very careful to pull the correct value from the table. An example where you would use 80 KSI weld electrode versus 70 would be if you have a grade 65 <laughs> steel and you're welding a grade 65 plate, and you need to have matching weld electrodes. And that would be an example of when you would use 80 KSI weld electrodes. All right. I didn't even know this table was in the manual until uh, I started putting this presentation together. This is on the very last page of Part 8. And I really think it should be moved closer to the front, because what a, what a nice table this has. It's very beneficial to see the, the relative cost of different size fillet welds. It lists in this table the number of passes required for various size fillet welds. So you can see the maximum size fillet weld for a single pass is 5 16 
And Bill Thornton has mentioned this in one of his past presentations, that for a 5 16 weld, you can place it in a single pass. And for a 5 8 weld, it takes six passes. So for twice the strength, it's six times the cost. So it's really a benefit for making welds smaller and longer rather than larger and shorter, I guess, you know, up to a point, right? The table also points out that, and this is true, the, typically the maximum size fillet weld that is preferred by fabricators is three-quarter inch. After a three-quarter inch fillet weld, it's commonly preferred to switch the weld over to a, a PJP, Just prep the plate and provide a PJP weld. Part nine, my favorite part, uh, contains information on prying. Now, prying has changed from manual to manual over the years, and uh, I don't doubt it's going to be changing in the new 15th edition that is due out here any, any day now. But the basic underlying principles have not changed. There's just been some minor changes in the design procedures. Make sure to read the current manual when it comes out or to go over the manual that's required for your specific project. Rotational ductility is also discussed in Part 9. Rotational ductility is of particular importance for end plate connections or built up WT connections. And the reason is you want to make sure to provide sufficient rotational ductility so the, the end plate rotates away from the support and is flexible. If it's too stiff, the moment will be attracted to the weld line and could potentially crack the weld since the weld is only size for a shear load and not an imposed moment. And the equations to check if there is sufficient rotational ductility are given in part nine of the manual. Also a nice little equation given in part nine is just to make sure your base metal has sufficient thickness for the weld size. Simply set the base metal shear rupture strength equal to the fillet weld strength and solve for T min. For a two-sided fillet weld, the minimum base metal thickness to fully develop the fillet weld would be 6.19 D over Fu of the base metal. Now, if you had a single angle and only had weld on one side, then you can divide the 6.19 D over Fu by 2 because you only have one line of weld, so you only need half the material base thickness. Our part 10 is useful because it contains all the different tables for typical gravity shear connections that are used by fabricators on projects. But figure 10-3 is of particular use when looking to see if connections will fit into a column. It would be very nice if engineers used uh, only 12 and W12 and W14 columns. But on smaller projects or industrial projects where it's preferred to get the tonnage down, uh, Typically, it is preferred, but was really preferred to get the tonnage down. W8 columns are generally, uh, are, it's not untypical to see W8 columns. And if the fabricator prefers to use double angles, will could very likely have the situations where the toes of the double angles encroach on the radius of the columns. If this is the case, figure 10-3 can be used to see if the amount of encroachment is acceptable take K detailing minus the thickness of the flange, and that is the acceptable encroachment. For single plate connections such as shear tabs or extended tabs, uh, for rotational ductility, a weld size equal to 5 8 T, T being the plate thickness, needs to be provided on each side of the plate. But as the plate skews, you have, uh, as the plate skews, there's a gap on the obtuse side. And table 10-14 in the manual increases the weld on the obtuse side by an amount of the gap. The AISC procedure for doing this is leaving the, the weld on the acute side the exact same, but on the obtuse side, increase the weld for the gap dimension. And table 10-14 covers the variation in welded, welds due to skewed plates. The only thing that we have found in our office that is slightly different is that fabricators typically prefer 
to go from 17 to 30 degrees all the way, skip the 30 to 45 and go straight to 45 degrees. And so this is a table that we typically use in our office. So basically they prefer not to shape the plate like this, but go ahead and open up the prep to a 45 degrees and provide a PJP weld on one side. Carol, could we pause for a minute? I think we have some audio issues. Yeah, sure. And we'll try to resolve that. Um, if everyone could just stand by for a few minutes, um, we'll look into, oh, I guess no one can hear us. Let me send that out, chat out to everyone. Okay, I, I believe we do have audio working, so you can, uh, you can resume. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, are we back online? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Okay, can we ask if there's any questions while we're taking a break? Uh, we don't have any questions right now. Okay. So go ahead. All right. Okay, hope everybody's awake out there. Okay. All right, let's continue on. Single plate. Right, if you want to see what the weld preps look like, one thing nice about the manual is that it contains uh, the joint configurations of all the pre-qualified weld joints. And this is good news because AWS D1.1 is pretty expensive, so it's very nice of AISC to include these figures in the manual. For skewed plates, the manual does kind of leave you hanging for plates over a half inch in thickness. The skewed plate welds contained in the manual only go up to a half inch. So if your plate's over a half an inch, then you're going to have to calculate the welds on a skewed plate. Right? For thick plates, it doesn't take a lot of skew to get the gap over 3 16 So if your gap is over 3 16 you can't simply add weld to the obtuse side then the plate will need to be prepped in a PJP weld provided on the obtuse side and the acute weld and the fillet weld on the acute side. Just for completeness, I do want to say that AWS does have a similar but slightly different procedure for designing skew plate welds. What AWS does is they take a benefit in strength on the acute side and take a hit in strength on the obtuse side and averages the two out. So it's like also an acceptable way of doing skewed plate well design. It's just a little bit different than from what AISC does. It's not uncommon at all to have insulation issues on skewed plates. In this particular case, the skewed plate is, uh, can't get weld on the back side because interference is at the toe of the column. So for sure, an okay solution would be to CJP the plate. But a lot of fabricators really prefer not to CJP plates if possible for a whole variety of reasons. So another option would be to, to provide a full depth effective throat PJP weld along with a reinforcing fillet. Now the effective throat of a PJP weld with a reinforcing fillet is defined as the minimum distance from the root of the prep all the way to the face of the weld. Once you know your effective throat, you can size the weld accordingly. Now, I do want to note you don't always have to use a single plate on skewed connections, especially if the skew becomes more and more sharp. A better option at that point would probably be to use a, a bent plate. But the only problem with a bent plate is the maximum thickness that fabricators can typically bend is a half an inch. When designing a bent plate, both legs are designed for eccentricity about the bend line. A really good discussion on the design of bent plates is in the 2001 third quarter EJ article by Larry Claver and Bill Thornton. And not always for all extended tabs or tabs do you need to provide a fillet weld equal to 5 T for rotational ductility. 
An example of when rotational ductility probably is not required would be at bracing connections and moment connections. Although I don't use the tables in the manual that much for design uh, of simple gravity connections because we have our own programs in, the, in our office, but I do find myself using table 10-2 quite a bit, especially if I get a phone call and the field needs a quick answer on the amount of field weld required if the, outstanding, if the holes in the outstanding leg of angles don't, don't align and it needs to be quickly welded. No problem, go to table 10-2 in the manual and you can quickly pull out your required fillet weld size. Moment connections are in part 11 and 12. Probably the best discussion in part 12 of the manual is for in extended end plate moment connections. In there it discusses that the maximum effective width of the end plate is the width of the flange plus one inch. It also discusses the, the need not to provide weld access holes if your beam flanges are CJP welded uh, to the end plate. So remember, no access holes. For more information and, and more in-depth discussion and design procedures on end plate designs, that is contained in part four, that is in design guide four and design guide 16. For bracing design, there is a, just some, some discussion in the manual, but I would highly recommend to, to download AISC's new design guide 29 by Larry Muir and Bill Thornton. This is an excellent design guide on bracing design, and it pretty much contains all information that you need to know on design of bracing connections. For typical gravity column splices, a, a contractor on a project should be able to go to, to the manual tables part 14.3 and choose whatever type of bolted or welded column splice they prefer to use on the project. These column splices are more historic in nature and have stood the test of time and should be completely acceptable for typical gravity column splices. Now, if you have an untypical gravity column splice, such as a column subject to integrity loading, then the column splice will have to be designed. I would still use the AISC column splices as a minimum lower bound, but uh, if you have just a typical column splice, you can simply go into the manual and use which one you prefer. At one time we were doing a job up in Canada and the anchor rods in the base plates were all misaligned and the fabricator told me that they just had this problem on, on every job. So I looked at the shop drawings and I think they were using like typical standard or oversized holes in the base plate. So I suggested that they use the AISC recommended maximum hole sizes in their base plate. Now, I wasn't sure why they weren't using them, but apparently those hole sizes are not in the Canadian manual. So we submitted an RFI to the EOR on that job and they approved it and sure enough, uh, all the problems with the base plates went away. So if you can use the maximum recommended sizes, uh, hole sizes in the base plates, it can be very be beneficial for aligning your anchor rods. Like this past year, surprisingly, the part of the manual that I, I probably used the most this past year was part 15. Uh, there's some discussion in there on brackets. We didn't really use the, dis the discussion on brackets for the design of brackets per se, but we use this for design of such things as partial depth stiffeners or haunches on top of beams. Very useful tool. The design of brackets has slightly changed between the 13th and 14th edition, so it's a very beneficial discussion that's included now in the 14th edition. If you're designing a project with uh, threaded rods, you have to specify the clevis for the end connections. Table 15-4 is where all the different clevis and clevis strengths are listed. We're not really, part 16 contains the specification and the various codes, but we're not going to really go in depth of what's contained in the spec or we would, uh, we would be here all day. But I do want to point out that in the specification there are user notes that can help with design. An example would be if you're checking a beam for shear and you need to calculate the shear strength, 
there's the CV variable. And CV, it can read in this user note, equals 1 for all W shapes except for a W44 by 230, 40 by 149, 36 by 135, W33 by 118, and all the way, and a few others to a 12 by 14. So for any other wide plan shape other than these listed, you can simply take CV equals to 1.0. I guess the only bad part is, is that these are pretty typical beam sizes, at least some of them. So if you do have to calculate the CV, it's really no problem. It's listed. The equations are listed in Part G2 of the specification. The RCSE is also contained in Part 16 of the manual. If I get a question on washer requirements, I go straight to Table 6.1. Table 6.1 gives the washer requirements for pretension bolts in oversized or slotted holes. Be particularly careful if you are using A490 bolts 1 inch or greater, greater than 1 inch diameter. For A490 bolts greater than 1 inch diameter in an oversized or slotted hole, you need thickened washers. So you don't want to be in a situation where they use typical washers in the, in the field and the inspector catches that. So you be careful to indicate that thickened washers are required. All right, to avoid uh, disputes on projects, that's a nice way of saying it, to avoid disputes on projects, everyone should read the Code of Standard Practice. Whether you are on the receiving or delegating end of connection design, there, is responsible, responsible that, there are things that each party is responsible for that need to be completed. So make sure everyone reads the Code of Standard Practice. Also discussed in there are fabrication tolerances and AES requirements for AEFS seal. Okay, so now we covered all the highlights of the manual. We're going to go through some design examples to illustrate how these are used. But before we go over the design examples, I want to illustrate what a good connection detail looks like. Whether you're designing connections in a connection design office, or whether you're just designing a connection for your own calculations in a design firm, all information really should be on the detail to facilitate checking and review. The spec, there's 36010, 36005, whatever specification year is to be followed should be on the detail, whether it is designed in ASD or LRFD, whether bearing bolts or slip critical bolts are used, the plate grade, the bolt grade, the bolt spacing, the fillet weld sizes, all information. The required loading is also very important. And if the loading isn't readily available on the contract documents, so you can easily find it, then make sure to indicate where that loading came from. You don't want to be in a situation where two months down the road you're trying to figure out where exactly did we get the load. So if it came in through an RFI, an email, a phone conversation, make sure to put that information on the detail. Okay, so for our first design example, we have a 14 by 90 column bearing on a W36 beam. And we're just going to check the beam for yielding and crippling to see if the W36 needs stiffeners. We have an axial load of 200 kips, and it's coming in 24 inches away from the end of the member. So somewhere between D over 2 to D from the end of the member. First, we're going to check the W36 web for local web yielding. So that's right underneath the flange, yielding of the web right here. To check local web yielding, we use equation J10-3. And the, and the reason we're using J10-3 versus J10-2 is because we are a distance closer in than D over 2 from the end of the member. Right? So the first thing to do is to determine the bearing length LB. The bearing length LB equals the thickness of the web, then we can assume a 2 and a half to 1 distribution each side of the column web through the thickness of the bearing plate. 
So the thickness of the column width plus 5t comes to 5.44. That is our bearing length. And I do want to say that we kind of borrowed this example from Don Sherman and Jeff Packer. This is a very similar example for bearing on HSS columns. It's just such a good example that I kind of wanted to borrow some of the information from it. Okay, so using equation J10.3, we calculate our, our, bear, our local web yielding stress, CFY, we do all calculations in LRFD, CFY times thickness of the web of the girder times 2.5K, and that's K design, not K detailing, K design, plus the bearing length LB, and that comes to 279 kips, greater than 200 kips. So okay, oh, yeah. so here's what it says um, in the specification. It says when the concentrate force is resisted, is applied at a distance from the end of the member that is less than or equal to the distance d, so it's closer than the distance d away, you have to use equation J10-3. If it was further than a distance d away, then equation J10-2 would be used, and this 2.5K would simply be 5K. Okay, next we check crippling, and since we are further away from the end of the member than a distance equal to D over 2, we can use J10-4. Now this is a very long equation. I guess it wouldn't be a problem if you're designing in Excel, but doing it by hand it can be a bit tedious. We have 0 0.8 times the thickness of the girder squared times the quantity of 1 times 3 times the bearing length over the depth of the girder times thickness of the web over thickness of the flange raised to the 1.5 times the square root of EFY thickness of the flange divided by thickness of the web. And what crippling is is just the little ripple in the web right underneath the bearing point. And this comes to 389 kips, greater than 200 kips. All right, so that's how you would check it using uh, the equations and the specifications. A much quicker way of going about it is to use table 9-4 in the manual. For checking web yielding, we can just simply use R1 and R2. So the, the web yielding strength is equal to VR1 plus the bearing length times VR2, which equals 279 kips the exact same value we got before, which is greater than 200 kips, okay. Now, table 9-4 is for the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is that you're right at the end of the member. Because AIC is going to produce a table, they have to produce it in a more conservative way. So right at the end of the member. So since we are at a distance further than D over 2 away from the end of the member, we can multiply the crippling strength by 2. So to check crippling, it's CR3 plus the bearing length and CR4, then times 2 is where the distance greater than D over 2 from the end of the member. In this case, that comes to 389 kips, greater than 200, okay, the exact same value we got before. Now, in this particular example, we're going to check if a column needs stiffeners for a beam moment connection to the column flange. We have a 14 by 90 column with a 24 by 55 beam with a 300 kip foot moment applied. The first thing to do is to determine your flange force. The flange force is simply the moment divided by the depth of the beam. 300 kip feet divided by 23.6 inches 153 kips. All right. Similarly to the example we just did, we're going to check local web yielding right behind the flange plate. And now we're away from the end of the member, so we get to use equation J10-2, and that comes to 161 kips, which is greater than the flange force of 153. We are okay. The same equation we just used for crippling, we now use that again, equation J10-4, and that comes to 192 kips. In this particular case, the bearing length is just simply equal to the thickness of the flange plate. 
All right, so if you have beams on both sides of the column and the flange at the same elevation, both flanges at the same elevation are in compression, then you have to also check web buckling of the column. Now this would not apply if you only had a beam to column on one side. It has to be on both sides of the column. This is, and both flanges need to be in compression. Checking web buckling using equation J10.8. It's just 24 times the thickness of the column web cubed times the square root of E over Fy of the column divided by H. And H is the clear distance between the radiuses, so D minus 2K design. And that comes to 194 kips, which is greater than 153. OK. Next comes local flange butt bending. I'm almost afraid to say this, but I'm going to say, if something's going to fail, it's most likely local flange bending. I would have said before one of our recent jobs that web buckling would never control. But uh, if you have a deep column such as a W24 or W36, then I have seen web buckling control, but it's very rare for W12 and W14 that that's going to control. Typically, flange bending is going to control, but you still have to check all the limit states. If you're going to check one real quick, this would be the one to check. Now this is only applicable if your flange is, is in tension, right? Not applicable for compression, only for tension. And for a more detailed discussion on this particular limit state, Omer Blodgett has a really nice read in the design of welded structures. It goes into an in-depth discussion on, on the derivation of this equation. Anyway, using uh, J10-1.9 times 6.25 Fy times the thickness of the column plane squared comes to 142 kips, greater than 153, less than 153. So this does control, no surprise, this does control and stiffeners are needed. OK, so those were the four limit states that we checked. Now we can, in lieu of going to the spec, we can simply go to the manual table 4-1, and these four variables right here will facilitate the check to see if the column needs stiffness. PW0 and PWI are for web local yielding. Simply take PW0 times plus PWI times the bearing length, LB, which is the thickness of the flange plate, and this gets 161 kips greater than 153. Okay, the exact same value. All right, well, I do want to say that one thing is in, if I go back one slide, I do want to say this, that table 4-1 does not include variables for, for web crippling. But just because the web crippling values are not in table 4-1, it doesn't mean they do not have to be checked. They still need to be checked. And I did talk to AISD about this. So in the 2000 and what would that be? 22? 2022 <laughs> manual, chances are pretty good you're going to see additional variables in here for checking crippling of the column web. So for now, what we're going to have to do is go to table 9-4 to check for crippling. We're away from the end of the member, so we just simply use 2 times R3 times the bearing length plus the bearing length times R4. And that comes to 192 kips. Greater than 153, OK. OK, now we can go back to table 4-1. For checking web buckling, it's just PWB. That's very easy, 194 kips, greater than 153. And then lastly, the flange bending equation is just PFB, 142. And just like before, it is less than 153, so no good. We do need to put stiffeners in our column. Oh, question time. Okay. And we have an interactive question for the audience, just to make sure they're paying attention. The question is, where is the table for beam bearing constants located in the manual? For the beam bearing constants, can you find that in part three, flexural members, part four, compression members, part nine, design of elements, or part 10, simple shear connections? Give everyone a few minutes to respond.
Okay, let's look at the results. So Carol, it looks like most people think that they can find the beam bearing constants in part nine of the manual design of elements. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. Um, and I'll take us to the next slide. Well, it, yeah, part the ones who answered part four were also technically correct too, I guess. That's true. Okay, so we'll give it to everyone. <laughs> All right, when, when using the, uh, the tables in the manual, it's actually very important to read the brief introduction to the table and the description of the table before the table that is given in the manual to just make sure that you properly understand the information contained in the table and that you are using it correctly. An example of this would be when using the UDL tables. First, we're going to go through how the UDL tables were derived and then talk about the discussion of the UDL tables. What UDL is, I mean, I would like to, use, to set up a poll asking how many engineers are using UDL right now. Uh, I, since we're not prepared to do that, I'm just going to guess about 20%. So I don't know, maybe 10. <laughs> Craig's saying lower 5. <laughs> okay. What UDL is, it's the total distributive load that a beam can su support to equal its full plastic flexural strength, assuming it to be completely braced. So what's sometimes done in our industry is that we take this total UDL load, U, W times L, and take a certain percentage of it for the end shear reactions. All right? And we're just going to go over an example of how the manual calculates these values. We have a, a 14 by 22 that is 20 feet long. And we're going to calculate the shear reaction based on 50% UDL. So that is 50% of the total distributive load that that beam can support based on the full plastic strength of the member for a span of 20 feet. When designing a beam, the strength can be based on flexure or shear. For flexure, the flexural strength is phi Fy times Z sub X of the member. For 14 by 22, that comes to 125 kit feet. So to determine the total distributive load, WL, we just sim simply set WL squared over 8, which is the moment for a distributively loaded beam, equal to the full plastic flexural strength of the member. Solving for WL at that point, we get a total uniform distributive load of 49.8. Easy enough. Now, as a beam becomes shorter and shorter, the shear strength of the member will start to control over the flexural strength. Back equation G2-1 can be used to determine the shear strength of the member. That comes to 94.5 kips. So the total distributive load that the member can support based on shear would simply be twice that, but since half the distributive load is going to go to each end of the member. So to determine the shear load at the end, we take the specified percentage of UDL, in this case 50%, or basically compare that to the shear capacity of the beam. Because no matter what the UDL gives you, you can't have a shear load that exceeds the shear capacity of the beam. And using the equations, we get WL is 49.8 kips. Take 50% of that, and that would be 24.9 kips. Now using the tables, we just simply enter the table with our, our length, 20 feet. We come over to the 14 by 22 value, and that comes to 49.8 kips, the exact same value that we, we received before. And take 50% of that, and that comes to 24.9 kips. And the shear capacity of the member is also listed in the table, 94.5, 94.5. Now just to illustrate the problems with UDL, I took this same exact beam and I pushed it through RAM to see the maximum moment I could get out, it for, get out of it for 100% composite action. And pushing this beam to 100% composite, I get a flexural strength of 297 kip feet. Now working backwards, setting that equal to WL squared over 8, I get a shear load equal to 
59.4 kips, which equals 119% UDL. And this is, in my mind, the problem with UDL. It might work okay for buildings such as industrial buildings where there's not composite members. But on commercial jobs where you have uh, composite members, it's, and I think it's really just a guesstimate what the percent of UDL is. I've seen it 50, 60, 100, 200. It really is uh, kind of an iffy way to go. In this particular case, you would be at 119% UDL. And I'm not suggesting by any means that engineers start using 119% UDL for composite beams dyes. I mean, that would just kill a job. But I just want probably a better way to go for composite beams would be to, to give the actual shear loads or a shear schedule. Either one of those would work. Okay. Um, in this particular case, this beam was sized based on shear load. The beam has a, a reaction coming in from a column. And the, the shear at the end of the member is actually equal to the shear capacity of the member. And this gave a UDL of 190% of UDL. So to specify 50% UDL could be grossly unconservative, which is, was actually the case on this particular project. Be very careful with using UDL for point loads. Right, in the connection world, it's not uncommon to have to work backwards. A fabricator has its list of preferred connections that they want to use on a project. And we have to work backwards to determine the minimum flexural, the minimum L, the shortest possible beam length that, can be, that the beam can have so the UDL does not exceed the strength of the connection. It's just kind of working backwards. But no problem using the same equation. In this particular case, we just set WL equal to the capacity of the connection and solve for L. And the same thing for shear, doing the same thing for shear. You set WL equal to the shear capacity of the beam, but because each side has to take 50% of the load, you can simply divide by two. And then the minimum length would be the maximum of the two lengths for flexure and for shear. Because remember, the shorter the beam, the higher the load based on UDL. So here's an example of that. Uh, for our particular case, the, sh the connection is good for 71 kips, and we want to know the shortest length of beam that will give us a capacity of 71 kips. First, based on flexure, using the shear capacity for WL, working backwards, that gives us a minimum length of 7.04 kips. And then we do the same exact thing based on shear. And again, 50% has to go to each side. So we simply divide by 2. And WL just now equals the shear strength of the member. And that comes to 5.29 feet. So we take the maximum of the two, which is 7 feet. Now just to check that we did everything correct, we can enter the table with 7 feet, come over to the UDL, which is 142, and simply divide it by 2 for 50% UDL, and that will give us 71 kips, the exact strength of our connection. So this works out pretty good. Also in this table, you can see that for 5 feet, which is the same 5 feet that we calculated based on shear, that there is a solid line right underneath the 5 feet. And then the shear load, UDL load is 189. So basically, that would be the shear capacity of the member times 2. And if you read the table description, the introduction to the table, it says above the heavy horizontal line in the table, the maximum total uniform load is limited by the strong axis available shear strength. So well, this is why it's important to read the descriptions of the table before you use the tables. OK. Next we're going to go over an example using the instantaneous center of rotation. The instantaneous center of rotation is commonly used for shear connections with eccentric shear load. But you can also use it for connections subject to pure rotation. An example of where that you would that might apply is if you had a spandrel connection where the facade is attached to the to the to the beam and you have a backup beam on the opposite side to kind of take out that twist. 
First, we're going to do it the elastic method. For a really good in-depth discussion on the elastic method, you can reference the design of steel structures by Salmon and Johnson. It's a very good example in there. All right, to determine the force in the bolt, let me go back one slide. So in this particular example, we have a 100 kip-inch applied moment due to the facade. And what we're going to determine is the maximum moment that this bolt group can resist. All right? So first, using the elastic method, the first thing to do is to determine the force in each bolt. To determine the force in each bolt, you have to determine the, plas the, the polar moment of inertia. To determine the polar moment of inertia, you sum the, both the x and y distance for each bolt about the center of gravity of the bolt group squared. Sum of x squared, sum of y squared for each bolt about the center of gravity of the bolt group. Get an I polar of IX plus IY equals 49.5 inches squared. All right, then to find the force component in each bolt, it's simply the applied moment times the maximum distance, the furthest distance from the center of gravity to the furthest bolt, Y, y max, divided by I polar. So to find the force in the X direction, you use the maximum Y distance. To find the force in the Y direction, you use the maximum x distance. Once you determine the force component in the y and the x, sum the squares, and that is the force component in the bolt. All right, then to determine the maximum moment, simply take the applied moment by the ratio of the bolt shear capacity over the actual force in the bolt, and that comes to 360 temperatures. Okay, so that was three pages of calculations. Now, in lieu of three pages of calculations, we can do three lines of calculations. We can simply take the C prime value in the tables. Now, this method uses the instantaneous center of rotation for pure rotation. We can take the C prime right out of the manual, equals 15.8, and the maximum moment that bolt group can resist is simply C prime times the bolt shear strength, 24.3, which comes to 384 kip pitches. So not only is it significantly less calculations, you get a great, there is a greater strength out of the connection. So this is definitely the way to go. If you're curious what C prime equals, you can actually calculate it using manual equation 7-21. It is kind of interesting to note for facade connections like this, uh, fandral connections, that the moment applied due the, to the facade should act op opposite the moment due to gravity in the, the backup beam. The facade moment would cause tension on the top flange of the backup beam, and gravity due to an extended tab connection would cause compression on the top flange of your backup beam. But if you just wanted to be conservative and simply add it all up and then be done with it, you can certainly do that. Uh, another little shortcut for this type of connection is to simply just increase the eccentricity for your gravity load by the distance of the facade moment divided by the shear in the beam, that increase in eccentricity. The only problem with this is if the shear load becomes very, very small, the eccentricity can become very, 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 very large, and it can throw you off the tables in, in the, that are given in the manual for essentially loaded well groups, for bolt groups. So if this is the case, and then you have to go back and use the C prime value. Also, I do want to note that extended tab configurations for these spandrel connections are not always necessary. It is commonly preferred by fabricators just to simply cope out the beam if the beam has sufficient strength and use a full depth tab. Okay, so in this case, example, we're going to pick a, uh, a clevis for a two-inch rod that is at full strength. To determine the, the tensile capacity of a threaded rod, we use the gross area of the rod, which is pi d squared over 4 times 0.9 fy of the rod comes to 102 kips. In our table 15-4, and we get a capacity for a number six rod of 135 kips. Okay. Now I do want to say that B 
these rod capacities are based on these clevis capacities are based on values supplied by Cleveland City Forge. So if you are getting a clevis from a different supplier, it's probably a good idea to ask for their capacities and check it against the capacities in table 15-4. This is an actual example from a project we were on where a detailer asked if a connection could fit into a W8 by 28 column. What we did is go into figure 10-3. An encroachment is simply determined from K detailing minus thickness of flange. So the acceptable encroachment in this particular case would be 3 16 of an inch. So the maximum acceptable width would be the T dimension of the column plus 2 times the encroachment equals 6 and a half, compared to our actual width, which is seven, 6 and 7 16 OK. But I do want to say that it is possible that the column does underrun by up to a quarter inch. So if this is a concern, if underrun of the column is a concern, then you probably want to take off an eighth inch each side. And then the, only, the maximal acceptable encroachment would only be about a sixteenth of an inch on each side. So if this is a concern, make sure to include the underrun dimensions. All right, just because the SE exam isn't all connection related, we're going to go over a few main member examples. I do not know what is on the PE or SE exam, but these type of examples are excellent to study for your test. In this particular case, the little twist or the trick of it is that there is a floor opening at grid B1. So when sizing the column at grid B1, you have to remember that the column is unbraced in the strong direction at the third level. We're going to determine the capacity of the column at grid B1. Hey, Kristen, do we only have 15 minutes left? Yes, if you could. Uh, We'll wrap up in 15 up. minutes. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap it up. We're going to we're going to kick it up a notch. Okay. In this particular case, we have uh, LX of 30 feet and LY of 15 feet. The first thing to do is to set KLX over RX equal to KLY over RY. From this, we can determine our equivalent KLY. Our equivalent KLY equals 18.1 feet, which is greater than our actual KLY of 15 feet, so the x direction controls. Go into table 4-1 and simply pull the value based on the KLY equivalent, because the table 4-1 is based on the KL over R, y, KL over R with respect to the y axis. Easy enough. We wanted to check it using the specification, just determine KL over, X, KL over R for the X and the Y. No surprise, the X controls. Then at this point, we can either go through the equations in Chapter E or simply go into Table 4-22 and pull the available buckling stress right out of the table for our KL over R value. Either one would work. In this particular case, we get 35 KSI, which is the exact same value in Table 4-22, and we get a strength of 927 kips. All right, and now we're going to check a beam, the W18 by 35 beam, 30 feet long, that is braced at 10 feet on center. It's only braced by the beams framing in. It determines the moment capacity of this beam. All right, we just simply go into table 3-2, and it looks like we're embraced at 10 feet on center. Now, if LP for an 18 by 35 was 10 feet, we could simply select NP and be done with it. But we are in between LP and LR, so we're going to have to interpolate between NP and MR. Just a quick reference, a reminder of the linear interpolation equation. Using that equation, we get 179 feet. It's also very convenient that Table 3-2 tells you if your flanges are non-compact. 
if they are non-compact, there's a little footnote F that's given in the table. And the plastic flexural strength of the member needs to be reduced. But that reduction is already included in Table 3-2, so no further reduction is needed. Alternately, you can use the beam charts. We have a 10-foot unbraced length. Simply come up to the beam charts till we hit 18 by 35 and come over and we have 180 kip feet, very close to the 179. Now these tables are based on a CB equal to 1.0. You can bump these moment values up for CBs greater than 1. You can determine your CB from table 3-1, in this case it would be 1.14, or using spec equation F1-1, either one. But if you bump up your flexural strength using the beam charts, be careful not to bump it up above the full plastic moment strength of the member. All right? You can't go above that. That's your upper limit. You wanted to then determine your deflection, you can use table 3-23. The deflection values for various types of beam loading are given in table 3-23. If you wanted to not use the tables and calculate everything by hand, that certainly is contained in the specification, Chapter F. Here you see the equation for the, the moment strength. F2-6 is the equation for LR. It certainly is a lot easier simply to, to pull that value from the table. And equation F-3 gives a reduction if you have non-compact flanges. F3-1 is for non-compact flanges, and F3-2 is for slender flanges. All right, this, is a, this figure comes right out of Columbus's uh, stability guide. If you want to read more information on the beam curves, you can see in, for the distance for brace length under LP, you're in the plastic range. From LP to LR, you enter in the in inelastic range of lateral torsional buckling. And beyond LR, you're into the elastic range for lateral torsional buckling. Ron Zemian has updated Columbus's book, and both of these books are now available on Amazon. AIC's manual also includes discussion on the beam curve. They have a kind of a simplified curve where they do a straight line for LP, then a linear line between LP and LR and then a curve in the elastic region. And here you can see the bump down for non-compact flanges. Okay, so in our last 10 minutes, we're going to go over an example of how to design composite beams. Uh, let's say a couple months ago, I got a phone call from a fabricator asking me how to use the composite beam tables in the manual. And I had to tell them that I had no idea how to use those tables in the manual. So this this example is in there for, for that particular in here for that particular fabricator. Once you started reading on how to use the tables in the manual, it's really easy to use them. You just kind of have to, to get over the learning curve on how to use them. In this particular case we have a 16 by 26 that spans 30 feet and we have three inch deck with three inches concrete on top. F prime C equals 4,000 KSI and 3 quarter inch diameter studs. Whether using the equations in the specification or using the tables in the manual, either way, this is the very first step that needs to be done. You have to calculate the effect of width of concrete slab. There are three equations to be used on each side, the length over 8 each side, half the distance to the center adjacent beam, or the distance to the edge of the slab. In this case, uh, the first one controls. We take twice 45 inches. That equals 90 inches. That's the effective width of the concrete. All right, in this particular example, we're just going to stick with 100% composite action for now. If you have 100% composite action, you will either have a neutral axis in the concrete or in the steel. To see where the neutral axis is, you have to check the strength of the concrete and compare it to the strength of the steel. The full strength of the concrete is is 0.85 F prime C times the depth of the concrete times the width equals 918 kips. And the full tensile strength of the steel is 384 kips. So we know the steel controls and the plastic neutral axis is in the concrete. 
for a 100% composite action then, we would size the stud for the tensile strength of the steel, 384 kips. To determine the amount of studs, we can use spec equation I18, which is given right here. It's 0.5 times the area of the stud times the square root of F prime of C times E, but not more than RG, RP times the area of the stud F U, where RG equals 1 if you have one stud per rib, 0.85 for two studs per rib, and 0.7 for three or more. And RP equals 0.6 if your stud is in the weak direction. And I would always just assume the stud is in the weak direction because you really don't know where the stud is going to be placed. So I would just leave RP as 0.6. We get 17.2 kips per stud. And you can pull that value right out of table 3-21 in the manual. 17.2, same exact value. All right, so now we're going to size our studs. Number of studs is controlled by the steel, 384, divided by 17.2, comes to 22.3, so basically 23 studs, each side of the point of maximum moment, so we would need 46 studs. But since our beam is only 30 feet long, that means we're going to have to double up the studs in some of the ribs. So our assumption of one stud per rib isn't exactly right, and we have to go back and recalculate our stud value with an RG of 0.85. And this now comes to 14.6 kips per stud, so we need more studs. In this particular case, we'll need 54 studs over the total length. Now, it is perfectly acceptable to only use the reduced stud value for the ribs that have two studs. And this is, although we didn't do it here, this is exactly what AAISC does in their design example on page 1-5 of the design examples that are available on AISC's website. Next, we determine the strength of the beam. Some moments about the center of the compression block, A, determine what A equals is just the sum of the strength of the studs, 384, divided by 0.85 F prime C times B was 1.25. Y2 equals the distance from the top of the steel to the center of the compression block equals 5.38. Of the summing moment about the center uh, of the compression block becomes 381 kp. Now we can do the exact same thing using the tables in the manual. The tables in the manual include this Y1 value, which is the distance from the top flange to various possible plastic neutral axis locations in the steel. One through five are in the flange, six is in the web, and seven is in the web. Seven represents 25% composite action, although not included in the specification. It's not a spec requirement. It's kind of the current state of practice to, not, to design beams not less than 25% Composite, and the reason of, for that is that there's simply just too much slip that is needed to activate the studs. In our case, our, we know that we are at uh, the, the concrete control, so we're at the top of the flange. We're at point zero. Here is our stud shear capacity, which is 384 kips, which is controlled by the steel. Our Y2 can be determined based on a, we previously did that, is 5.38. So we're, we know we're in the top row, y1 equals 0, and we know our y2 equals 5.38, so we have to interpolate between the moment strength given for a y2, a 5, and 5.5. And interpolating from the table, we get 381 kip feet, which is exactly what we got when we did it by hand. All right, but it's probably more common in the industry to design beams using partial composite acting. It's uh, more cost effective. So I'm just going to quickly go over the design of partially composite beams. We're going to use 63% composite action. For 63%, our force would be reduced from the full strength of the steel by 63% to uh, times 0.63 comes to 242. For Partial composite action, you have a plastic neutral axis in both the concrete 
and steel. So part of the steel is going to be in compression. Determine the depth of concrete that is effective. We just take our stud shear strength that has now been reduced, 242, about 0.85 F times C times B comes to 0.791. Our Y2 value is now 5.6. We know we're at 0.4 because our stud value is at 242. We are right at 0.4. That's where the location of the plastic neutral axis in the steel is located. We're at 5.6, so we have to interpolate between the two values. And that comes to 326 kip feet. So that's how easy it is to design a beam for partial composite action. Now, if you wanted to do it by hand, there's a nice equation given in the commentary to I3, equation I3-10 in the commentary, where you simply just sum moments about the center of the, the compression in the steel. To determine the compression force in the steel, simply sum moments about in the x direction, and the compression force in the steel equals the full tension strength of the steel minus the compression in the slab divided by 2. All right, so C equals the sum of the stud capacity that's provided. PY equals the tension strength of the steel. And D1, D2, and D3 are just distances from distances to the center of gravity of the compression steel. OK, so to some moments about the compression steel, first we've got to calculate C, which is 242 kips, and A. It's just C divided by 0.85 at prime of C, 0.79. D1 is the distance from the top of the steel to the center of the compression block, which is 5.6. D3 is just half the depth of the member. Now, D2 is critical to calculate. D2 is the distance from the top of the steel to the center line of the compression force in the steel. This is our equation right here uh, for the compressive force in the steel the total tension strength of the steel minus, by, minus the compression force in the concrete over 2. That gives us our force divided by B of F, the width of the flange, Fy of the flange, then over 2 because we're going to the center. And that says 0 .1, 0 0.129. So we're still within the flange, so that's good. Otherwise, we'd have to revise the equation. And now we simply some moments about the center of the compression force in the steel, calculated all our D distances, and that comes to 4,351 kip inches or 326 kip feet, which is the exact same value we got when we used the table. Now we're going to calculate the number of studs. And let's go back to assuming we get a stud per foot. So 0.63, because we're 63% composite, times 384, divided by 17.2, assuming one stud per foot, comes to 14.1, so 15, so 30, 30 studs. And since the beam is 30 feet long, it should be OK. If you wanted to be a little bit conservative, you could use the lower value. All right, so finished, I guess, on time. <laughs> so just to hit the highlights. Be familiar with the information contained in the manual. Use the database when possible. Very efficient. Read the descriptions of the table before using the tables just to make sure you're using them correctly. Include all design information on details to facilitate review. Just makes checking that much easier. And use the manual, information in the manual for efficient design. All right. That's exactly an hour and a half, right? Okay. Thank you, Carol. Um, we still want to get a few participant questions in here. I'm sorry we're running a little bit long, um, but we have time for a few questions. I'll get right to it. The first question, I'll take us to slide 36. The question is, is encroachment applicable for end plates as well and not just double angles? Yes. So, uh, do I have to repeat the question or no? No, no. <laughs> So, OK, yes, it is completely acceptable. But just be careful that these members, the supports, can underrun. So you have to be, if that is a concern, uh, just remember that. But yes, it's completely acceptable to use this for end plates. OK, thank you. And the next question, I'll stay on this slide. Um, in the upper right here, we have uh, a double angle connection. And the question is, are there provisions for determining the axial capacity of the clip angle connections? 
in Part 9 of the manual? Well, yes and no. Okay, so for, if you were going to a column plan, you could use Part 9 of the manual and check prying of the angles. But in this particular case, you have to be very careful because you're going to a column web. And the column web is incredibly thin. And well, it could be, it could be thin. In this case, it is. And it's going to have very limited capacity to actually develop that Q prying force. So in that particular case, I don't think I would allow the angles to pry. They could still bend. And then you have to also check the column web for a yield line analysis. I believe the equations for yield line are in the new 2016 specification, but if, if they're also in Ichabar Tambuli's book on the design of steel connections, the yield line analysis. But and, and usually we keep the utilization, the column web utilization is anything greater than maybe 10 percent. It's kind of a judgment call. Then we will not let prying happen in the angles because the web of that column is just too thin to develop the Q force. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I'll take up to slide 43. We had a couple of questions regarding your uh, field weld symbol and why it is on the bottom of the uh, weld arrow. Well, the field, the, when it's on the bottom, that indicates the arrow side. If it's on the top, it, that indicates the opposite side. So I think it's okay the way it's shown. Okay. So if, the, an example of that would be if you went to the the weld for the skewed plates, the weld size, the, the, when the fillet is on the bottom of the line, that is on the side of the plate where the arrow points. If it's on the top of the line, it's on the opposite side to where the arrow points. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I'll take us to slide 61. The question is regarding the bearing length, L sub B. Where does that come from? Well, it depends on your type of connection. In this particular example, this was our first example, right? The bearing length would, was this the first example? Equals the column web, and we used a, a two and a half to one distribution through the base plate on each side. And the reference for this was Don Sherman's and Jeff Packer's example they used in Design Guide 24 for the, except the bearing length when checking a beam bearing on an HSS column. So it's very similar, and that's where the background of this comes from. And actually, the 2.5 to 1 distribution is really similar to the 2.5K that is used in equation J10-3. So it's just a common equation in the industry to use a 2.5 to 1 distribution. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I'll take the slide 68. Can you explain why local flange bending applies to tension only and not compression? Well, the reason is is because that is what the spec says. <laughs> the spec says that it is only applicable limit state for, for tension. And I think the reason is that if it's in compression, the web is so much more rigid than the flange that load is going to kind of migrate and bearing uh, to the web of the column. Okay. And then I think we have time for another question. Um, I'll take us back to 66. Oh, sorry, 67. In this figure here, if the top of the column were flush with the top of the beam, mm -hmm. how would you check the web local crippling? If the top of the column were flush with the top of the beam, meaning that the flange plate was top with was flush, I would divide. I would. You would divide this equation by two. If you are closer than a distance, uh, if you are closer than a distance d over two from the end of the member, I believe that's what it is in the spec. J 10 dash eight needs to be divided by two, so that would be applicable in that situation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. If your question did not get answered, we will get back to you by email with a response.